It's the commencement of a new month and welcome to the AM News. My name is Pakwesi Shandoff. We start with some news on the labor front where the Trade Unions Congress says that it is worried about the high cost of living in the country. The labor union argues that the situation is not only suffocating the Guinean worker but also increasing poverty. The TUC expects government to put in place measures to arrest the situation. Samo Mbura has details in the following report. The Trade Union Congress is demanding government suspends all taxes on petroleum and gas products to lessen the cost of living in the country. Secretary General of the Trade Union Congress, Dr. Anthony Arba, says the prevailing economic conditions make the demand relevant and appropriate in view of current global challenges. Ghana joins the rest of the world to celebrate Workers' Solidarity Day. According to the TUC, the level of poverty and deprivation even among workers is worse Therefore, the need to suspend the taxes. The cost of living in Ghana is much higher, even if the price of petrol is lower. And the impact of the price of uh, the fuel price increases is much more severe on Ghanaians. We therefore call on government to suspend all taxes and all levies on petrol. Dr. Yaba also appealed to President Akufado to consider granting workers a cost of living allowances to cope with the current economic difficulties. Mr. President, I would like to appeal to you to use your executive powers to grant a COLA of at least 20% to all public sector workers. But President Akufado has described as unsustainable the call for the removal of taxes on petroleum products. On the VEX matter, of petroleum price increases. The suggestion has been made, which has also been repeated by the Secretary General, is at this moment not sustainable. Removing taxes on petroleum products will reduce government revenues by some 4 billion CDs. At this time, when we're determined to expand government revenues in order to increase our capacity, to finance our own development, can we afford to reduce government revenues by 4 billion CDs? He however admitted working conditions in the public sector are not the best. He assured ongoing policies will help fix the defects. Samuel Mbure support for Joy News. Still on the labor front, the Civil and Local Government Staff Association of Ghana has described as unacceptable the continuous interference in their work by people they describe as special assistants and consultants appointed by the government. Some of the consultants, according to them, have been working to remove ghost names on the public payroll. Addressing a thanksgiving service to mark the May Day celebration, General Secretary of Clocksack, Dr. Isaac Bampoado, said that the special assistants have proven to be a drain on the resources of the country and therefore he wants the chief of staff to act on their demands. Good that most of the metropolitan and municipal assemblies closer to the regional capitals have a huge financial burden which must be dealt with on daily, weekly, and monthly basis. These include huge monthly salaries of internal generated funds, paid staff, high cost of sanitation, management, routine dredging, and the silting of drains and maintenance of roads. Frequency, consistency, and time use payment of property rates are the reasons why most metropolitan and municipal assemblies are able to provide these routine services. Centrally collected funds such as District Assembly Common Fund, District Development Fund, have had challenges with frequency and consistency as well as releases, thereby distorting the implementation of planned programs, projects, and policies of the various assemblies. Another area of concern is the interference in the mandate of the controller and accountant general as the sole controller of all treasuries in the public services. At the moment, not all treasuries in the public sector are managed by staff of the controller and accountant general's department. If the current role of partial supervision by the controller and accountant general's department is reversed, and the traditional practice where controller and accountant general's department was in charge of all treasuries in the public service, receives a disbursement of funds 
will be more efficaciously done. Away from that, a hybrid waste to energy power plant has been commissioned at the Jankoba in the Atrima in Wabeja municipality of the Ashanti region. The 400 kilowatt facility can convert 12 tons of waste into biofertilizer and energy daily and has been funded by the German government through the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. The 6.2 million euro project is tipped as one of the solutions to Ghana's waste management and power generation challenges while generally reducing the health hazards from pollution and climate change. Mahmoud Nuruddin reports. The project is considered one of the solutions to waste management in Ghana. Minister of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, Dr. Kwekua Friye says the hybrid project is timely to address to address serious waste management issues. I'm delighted to see the deployment of these technologies, that is biogas, pyrolysis, in the dealing with both organic and plastic with waste management in addition to the harnessing of the sun for energy generation in the country which tackles nine of the SDGs that is SDG 1, 3, 6, 7, 11, 13, 14, 15 and 17 According to him, government will continue to engage stakeholders to present innovative and sustainable projects to help address many challenges facing the country. Government has and will continue to engage stakeholders to come up with innovative and sustainable projects just as what we are witnessing today. The hybrid waste to energy project has come at a time when major cities like Accra and Kumasi are facing dire challenges in finding final dump sites. Indeed, the highlight of this project for me is the utilization of municipal waste for generation of power, which could be the sustainable alternative for curbing the waste management challenges facing metropolitan municipalities and districts and regions in Ghana. Dr. Friye points out that the plant will help to generate power as well as produce biofertilizers for farmers. including tackling the problem of waste and generating power as a byproduct by converting waste into useful energy. This innovative 400 kilowatt power hybrid waste to energy facility will harness energy from solar PV panels, biogas and pyrolysis technologies to treat municipal solid waste. Let me take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, the German Biomass Research Center, the Universität Rostock, and the Ministry of Environment, Science, and Technology and Innovation. Caused by the COVID-19 pandemic we heard about, all those involved have driven the project forward with unprecedented commitment. Everyone involved showed great flexibility. For example, a plan for refuse to refuel fuel with plastic recycling is now being used instead of plastic paralysis. Thus, the scientific question of how plastic waste can be recycled sustainably in Ghana will still be addressed. Plans are advanced to build 10 more of such plants in other regions across the country within a period of 20 years, a report by Mohamed Nuruddin. Let's now turn our attention to the governing new patriotic party's internal elections where police have arrested one person for breach 
of electoral regulations at the Asawasi constituency. The individual who is yet to be named by the police refused to leave the voting area after the police called for his exit. The third day of the constituency elections of the NPP in the Ashanti region recorded pockets of some violent incidents. Nanaya Ujima followed some constituencies and filed this report. The police had to arrest one person at Asawase to restore calm to the voting area. The election continued without any incidents. At the Ajuso constituency, eight of the ten candidates for various positions, including chairmanship, ran unopposed. Earlier, some aggrieved persons who claimed polling station election was held in breach of party laws sought injunction restraining the election. But delegates on Sunday showed up in their numbers to cast their ballots. Member of Parliament John Ampuntiakuma sees this as a show of unity among members. In fact, there was a lot of consensus engagement in this process. And I particularly led a lot of consensus building in run up to the contest. And in the end, we were able to achieve unopposed positions for eight aspirants. And the two uh, other positions were open to people to contest. The time is now to work together to achieve the break the eight vision and objective of the party in 2024. Uh, we have done it before. We will continue to work together in unity in Ejuso and make sure that we help the region and the, and, the, and the party at the national level to break the eight in 2024. In the Ophirikum constituency, voting delayed for hours after one of the candidates for youth organizer position only heard of disqualification in the morning, Benjamin Eduampofo spoke to Joy News. I don't disqualify constituency after polling station elections was divided between the incumbent MP, Francis Asensobache, and party chair, Fifi Mensa, against others who wanted to unseat the incumbent. Some party executives, including the chairman, were retained in the elections. Bantama is proud of all that the MP is doing, of, of the good work that we have done. And, and the votes is clear to show. So we are very grateful to all the Bantama people, to all the police station executives. I want you to go to the corners of Barakesi that Fifi has won. But I know that we all get back on board to work towards a stronger 2024 for the new patriotic party. Meanwhile, in the Wild Central constituency, 49-year-old Wild Municipal Science Resource Coordinator Osman Abdul Hamid has defeated incumbent chairman Ali Karim Kamara, who has been on the seat for 12 years. Abdul Hamid pulled a total of 558 votes as against 341 by Ali Kamara. Correspondent Rafik Salam has more. Though the pictures of the war mayor Isaac Utai Mumin and the founder of Haji Umu Foundation were not on any of the ballot papers, the election was considered as a dress rehearsal of an encore for 2024 MPP parliamentary primary. The two starlets, both from the prestigious world Limayri clan and their descendants of Brigade Imam Yamuru, pulled the strings and was in enormous influence in the party. Oftentimes, they split opinions and normally creates a wedge in the party. This election is therefore not different. The use of two factions or teams emerge in the party and are requesting government and grassroots teams. Chairman Ali Karim Kunsampo Kamara led the perceived government team and the other led by the former secretary of the party and one time labeled as his hatchet man, 49-year-old war municipal science resource coordinator Osman Abdul Hamid. The campaign leading to the election was dirty and replete with mass linging and vituperations. The combined security personnel drawn from the Ghana Armed Forces and the Ghana Police Service were alert and ensured that it was conducted peacefully. In the end, Osman Abdul Hamid dethroned his former boss, Chairman Ali Karim Kunsampo Kamara. We have three candidates in the contest. The third candidate pulled 131 votes 
and the name is Isahak Sibik. The second runner up pulled 341 votes, and that is Ali Karim Kamara. The one who pulled the highest votes of 558. Thank you very much. Let me all, first of all, give thanks to the Almighty. I think, uh, looking at the euphoria, God has done his work because you realize that the journey has not been easy. But finally, finally, we are at the end today. So we give praises to the Almighty and the delegates. Are you surprised about your victory? I'm not surprised at all. I saw it coming. In fact, his team, known as the grassroots team, won eight out of the 10 executive positions are asked whether the embarrassing defeat is a referendum on the government. The person who God has chosen to unite this party has taken the mantle and we will do everything possible to unite, whether team grassroots or team what. The grassroots means that the people down from the delegates and non executives they are the people that we are talking about. And if you are talking about government, it's always the party that always gives birth to the government. Sure. And now that we have the party in our hand, we will work together with the government sure. so that whatever it is, we will win the worst central seat. Sure. 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 Does the former chairman has a role in this administration? Now, I, 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 I was telling my people that if they ask us to bring a former chairman, we will not get it. No, now, God be so wonderful. From today and today, no, we have a former chairman. So when the role comes, for him to come and play the role, we will get somebody to play the role for che former chairman. So the, the, the same applies to other executives who have lost. We are bringing them together. Mr. Osman's former position as secretary of the party will not be occupied by his Brown school days mate at what secondary school, Mumun Abbas Siddiq, assembly member for Kota Electoral Area, Takura Atawa, beat three other women to become the party's women organizer. The women's win is too weak to the extent that we can't even describe it. So as I'm camping, I'm coming to mobilize the women, always get empower them with skills, I'm this, a, a woman with skills, like pomade training, soap making, always I'll be moving uh, all around the uh, electoral areas, training the women across. And I'll always feed them information. I will hide information from them. This is the new thing I'm bringing on board. Oh, there you are, and here I am in the studio. But I did tell you this morning that I had a wonderful surprise. I am <laughs> excited. And you'll find out why. Ladies and gentlemen, Ghana for I give you Bernice Abubedo Lanza. You're making me feel so special. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning to you. I've missed you all, yeah? It's good to be back. Good to see good you. To see you Look too. what the net just dragged in. And <laughs> she's my co-host, and we're going to be doing this together mm -hmm. right here on the AM show. So you know what is coming. It's worth waking yeah. up for, isn't it? Charlie. Thanks for joining. So, right. so let's do this. Uh, in the absence of the papers which have decided to go on holiday, mm -hmm. uh, we've also decided to go online <laughs> <laughs> and do a lot of stories. But, but some of these stories, um, I mean, they are captured on the news portal portals, but there are other things that we've also seen over the weekend. Mm. Let me just let all of you know that we'll also be joined by Suleiman Abraima via Zoom. He'll also be sharing his take. But what do you think about this entire TUC clock sag divide, mm -hmm. you know? Clocks have actually executed this threat. It ended up doing something on its own. Yes. All because they felt that, well, you think we don't, what, neutrality allowance and all of that. So there's a bit of a divide. I don't know how you feel that is going to affect the labor front. Mm. I, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I wait to see what uh, the days will, will bring. I mean, this is unfolding. And like you said, clocks are threatened and they executed the threat. So. Let's see how labor works this out. But it's interesting, you know, anytime there's a shift, you, well, sometimes it's, it's for, for the good, sometimes it's, it's not. Uh, what do you think so about this, though? Because they, they have said that it's not so much about the name, 
Yeah. They just wanted something with which to couch it. So it's not so much about neutrality, so mm, to speak. Mm, mm. It's just about the fact that, and if you look at what the TUC uh, uh, General Secretary is saying, Dr. Ba is saying that, give us 20% of our cost of living allowance. Because, and, and it makes sense, some of what they're calling for. You look at the fact that we have our minimum wage mm -hmm. and a liter of fuel is 80% of that minimum wage. So you how ask yourself, going to get back? How, how do you, you do the math? A lot of these public sector workers, maybe a thousand, very few of them are at a thousand eight hundred or more. A lot of them are below. How are they going to, you know, keep body and soul together? Mm. Well, we wait to see, like I say. And then let me just take this opportunity to wish everybody a happy workers day holiday <laughs> you know the day was yesterday but we are all you know we've been given some rest mm. and it's important so uh, we'll be talking about these issues delving deeper into into it and uh, obviously when you talk about workers you talk about cost of living you talk about expenses you just have to mention the e levy because it's the most talked about thing right now in the country online on air <laughs> on the ground <laughs> everywhere everywhere you know everybody's e talking is about e levy i know right so uh, I mean, you'll be delving definitely with, with our guests. We'll be talking oh, yeah, more we'll about... We'll be talking about it in the course of the news review as well. Yeah, Have you yeah. tried uh, you know, making a transaction? Yes, so I, I used my bank app to transfer to someone's mobile money account. I just okay. wanted to see how it worked there. But it was below 100 CDs. I did that because there have been concerns, and I've actually seen evidence of people who've been charged yeah. uh, below the 100 CDs. So sending 10 CDs, yes, 20 CDs, below the 100 CD threshold. So... Um, I wasn't charged anything, and I was, I was excited about that. Because, yeah. but then we see there's a lot of irregularities. So, I mean, people are experiencing different things. I don't know what the the, the factor is. We will get some explanation. It's not the algorithm that. that is not. And you know, uh, I don't know whether this vindicates mm. Sam Jata George, member mm -hmm, of Parliament mm -hmm, for the mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. he raised some of these mm -hmm. concerns. But I also, on the other side. As a journalist, my curiosity was triggered. I, I have not done it myself. Okay. Honestly, prior to this, a lot of the money I had in my, I used it for other things. So I have practically nothing in my mobile right now. But for those who were sending, some of them that you cannot confirm, you know, they tell you I sent 20, 50. The problem is verifying that they had not sent 100 already. Earlier, you're and right. You're now, right. because whatever that else you sent after 100. That makes sense. But there are people I also know from even in-house mm -hmm. who sent, and we could confirm that they hadn't sent up to 100 already, mm -hmm. and they were facing these problems. So mm -hmm. it's and a And even bit someone who claims he sent for uh, his accounts on different networks, he mm -hmm. had... He had this, he had the, yeah. registered with his Ghana card. And so it should identify him as the same person, shouldn't it? Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Um, you know, when I was interacting with Dr. Kuma, uh, the Deputy Finance Minister last week, mm. he did mention that as of now, maybe until July when there is more regularization and the telcos fully integrate, you'll be facing some of these challenges. So mm. that if you have three, you're on three different telcos and all of them are on, mobile money. Mm. If you send, let's say, 30 from here and 40 from there and another, let's say, 35, mm. the five CDs will be hit, likely, because okay. the system identifies you as... Different you know, people. Ex exactly. Okay. So, sort of. Mm. So, there, so, there, there, so, then again, so then again, the question arises, were we ready for this? Were we really ready for this? Um, what do you think? On the back of all that you've seen, were we ready? Well, it's well, it's early days yet, but based on some of the concerns that have come up, you'd have expected that people, first off, people were not in favor of this at all. So and when you, you when you roll it out, sometimes we we pretend just as we mm. did with the district level, the local level Elect elections. People said we are for the elections, but not for the politics of it, not okay. for political mm -hmm. parties. Mm -hmm. Same here. I feel it was pretty clear. No mm. matter what anyone tries to paint for mm. us, it was pretty clear where mm. the people stood mm. when it came to the mm -hmm. elect. Mm -hmm. It was clear. So so once the people kicked against it, there were there were there was mass protest. There was. People were online. People were trying to get signatures, you know, to prevent the e-levy from being implemented. So once you, you decide to go ahead, you should start off on a good note. Right. Do you to get my point? some of these. But, but, but even as we say that, 
is it also practical to expect that of the system? Because it's it's a system that needs fine tuning. Mm -hmm. We are now starting. So I was discussing this. With, know, I was discussing so. this with a call earlier, and I said, well, I know that that could be a reason we're given that oh you know some of these things we need to rule it out and then we'll find some of the loopholes and then fine tune it but let's see how it goes but i'm told we have a uh, suleiman abraima uh, with us hello good morning thank you for joining us hello mr abraima hello okay now we can hear you and if you're hearing that sweet voice in the background, it is the voice of Bernice Abubeidu Lanta. I'm sure you've not seen her in a while. She is on the show uh, with me this morning. Happy holiday to you and happy Eid in advance, Suley. Thank you very much for having me uh, and happy Eid to all Muslim colleagues. Um, we thank Allah for how far he's brought us. Mm, great. So, I mean, well, today we don't have the papers. It's a holiday as expected but we've decided to go online. Uh, one issue that is trending is the e-levy. Have you tried sending anyone money on any of the electronic uh, platforms since yesterday? And what's, what has your experience been? Well, um, I did yesterday uh, a couple of times. I needed to reach out to a few friends and, and family people. And uh, on, on all occasions, um, the tax was applied. So I think that in my experience, and it also because I was uh, sending something a little more than the 100 threshold, uh, it worked in a way that I wouldn't say um, there were technical issues. But of course, I've also um, come across people who have said that they were trying to send less than 100 and had a tax applied to them, contrary to what the expectations are in terms of the threshold. And so, um, and I did say some time ago that if the tax was going to be implemented on May 1, given the circumstances mm. of lack of public education and all of that, I did expect that there will be confusion and, and chaos. And I think that, of course, maybe chaos, it's maybe on the higher side in terms of uh, violent scenes and all of that. But in terms of confusion, I think what we've seen so far uh, is exactly what one would expect to happen. Mm -hmm. um, the public education was not there. People who are merchants don't even understand what, you know, the system is, how the system is going to operate, whether it's when you are withdrawing or when you are sending. Mm -hmm. I think- I, 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 Just to interject, I saw a, a communication from the mobile money agents nationwide, their association, pointing to the fact that the agents shouldn't take the 1.5% the, the because it, it is automatic. You know, some people were actually thinking, and the agents themselves didn't have a proper understanding of it. Exactly. I, I think that all the town halls that were being organized was mainly for the political buy-in rather than public education on mm. what the interview is all about, mm. how it would work in terms of how it would affect individual transactions. But I think that um, as we go along, we would see how people are going to uh, react ultimately. Because if you think of it, it's really something that comes down to um, double, triple, quadruple taxation. And I think that it makes it quite very, very obnoxious, particularly for those of us who, at the end of the month, have to pay our income tax. And then beyond that, whatever comes to you as net, if you are sending a part of that to your mother, to your father, then you pay tax on it again. Mm. If your mother, your father is sending part of what you sent to them to other friends or relatives, they have to pay tax on that again. I think that we need to we need to really have a proper conversation about this because the way it is, I don't think it's a tax that is really um, fair. Mm. And if, if I may top up, I do not know, but I'm sure you know of actress Yvonne, Yvonne Nelson. Uh, she says... Uh, She's been posting on social media. She says Ghanaians were lured into voting for the president with his big English. I, I, I don't shy away from, you know, controversial stuff. But, but she focuses on the fact that the e-levy is a slap in the face of the ordinary Ghanaian. Um, and, and like you're saying, it, it would appear that with one sum of money, you could be taxed back, forward, side, <laughs> side, top, bottom. Do you agree with her? 
Well, I, I agree with a bit about the tax and how obnoxious it is in terms of how it can just be, you know, doing multiple, it's, it's really about multiple taxation. Um, so you're going to buy fuel and you want to pay with mobile money and you have to pay um, tax on that. On top of that, there are taxes on our fuel and the money that you are, you are using is really about you know, the, the net, whatever you've earned after government's taxes from, from your salary. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that, so my sister is a trader at the market. And then uh, if, if she wants to maybe uh, buy something from, from Tamale or buy something from Ijra or wherever, what it means is that consistently his income, I mean, his, his capital is what is going to be taxed. I think that there ought to have been a mechanism to ensure that the tax would apply to persons who are mm -hmm. who generate income mm -hmm. and yet do not pay taxes to the government. Mm -hmm. I think that everyone should, needs to pay tax. Mm -hmm. So long as you earn some income, whether you are a plumber, electrician, a tiler, you know, a mechanic, whatever it is, I think that that ought to have been the target. Those who earn income and yet they're having no mechanism to pay income tax. But the way it is now, I mean, it's, it's quite obnoxious. Mm. But in terms of the other comments about the president having lured mm -hmm. people to vote for him with big English, I think that is a, a very political comment. And from the experience so far, I, I think that perhaps as, as a people in this country, we need to begin to have a very, very big conversation, a serious debate about the kind of governance we, we want to have. Uh, because over the years, I don't think that we have experienced the, the kind of governance that this country must have. And it's not enough to say that, look, um, the previous government was better, this one is worse, and so on. Otherwise, what we are saying is, oh, well, what we had was better, therefore, let's have that back. And even if what they continue to do what they did in terms of the levels of corruption, in terms of the mismanagement and all of that, which we are also experiencing now, except that people expected better governance. People expected President Ekufuado to do better. People mm. expected so much of the MPP government. Did, and did, did, did you, uh, you keep using the impersonal term people, did you uh, expect more from him as well? Are you disappointed? I am, I am very, very disappointed. In fact, uh, people have said time and again to me, Anytime I raise concerns that, oh, please shut up because you were among those who were, you know, bitterly complaining under the Mahama regime. Right. Uh, you did a lot to bring the Mahama government down. I'm not sure because I don't think that I have that much power. But people think, well, we did whatever to contribute or some of us did whatever to contribute to the downfall or the defeat of the Mahama regime. And so, yes, I did have great expectations. Um, I, I thought President Ekufuado, the experience he had, you know, what we were told about his human rights track record, his incorruptibility, and so on and so forth. We were going to see a complete departure of the kind of governance that we had. But, I mean, it's been a, an extreme disappointment. Mm -hmm. In some cases, I think that it's been worse. In terms of corruption, I, I, we, we, we know the Transparency um, International Corruption Perception Index, and so far the record indicates that the, the worst performance of President Mahama has been the best performance of Akufuad on, on, on issues of corruption. I am extremely disappointed when it comes to fundamental rights, particularly free expression and, and media freedom rights. And then, of course, the economy. We all had expectations that President Baumia knew a lot about what this country needed. Um, he had a lot of solutions. It turns out the solutions were in worse. Uh, in flowery language. And what we're going through, um, of course, isn't better than what we had before. Mm. Talking about the economy and uh, how much people have to pay now for services and goods uh, brings to mind what we've been seeing, especially on the labor front. I mean, we've seen a lot of agitation recently. And the agitation is now gone beyond the demand for better salaries and wages. There appears to be uh, some confusion brewing am among, you know, the various groups, TUC, Clock, SAG, 
especially over this new neutrality allowance issue. Now, clocks had threatened to hold a separate event because TUC was not in agreement with uh, what they were seeking. And yesterday, they carried that out. Let's just, uh, your thoughts on what this could mean for the future of labor in terms of, you know, coming together, marshalling forces, fighting for what they believe is due them. Well, I think that um, labor is right in the demands that they are making. At some point in our history, something was introduced called the Fair, Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. And by its name, I believe what we intended was to ensure that the little that we have is shared in a fair manner when it comes to wages and salaries. Mm. But I think that we've continued to see um, the big dichotomy in terms of what happens to a certain class of appointees and what happens to the people who are laboring for this country. Um, if, you, if you look at teachers, you look at nurses, you look at you know, the, the, the group that you know, belong to CLOSAC and how much they are earning versus how much someone gets to earn once they get an appointment by the president, you wonder whether we have two Ghanas, you know, and, and one Ghana having some great resources to pay a certain class of people at a certain rate. And another and, and, Ghana. And even, uh, pardon the interjection, uh, Suleimana, but even as you mentioned this, it is topical and important. Uh, you know, it's been mentioned that some CEOs of even underperforming or poorly performing SOEs are earning three times what Mr. President gets. The question is, on what basis? I, I just wanted to throw that in there as well. Yeah, I, you see, I think that that's, that's in principle right. But in practice, sometimes I, I really wouldn't go for that bit when people say, oh, they, they've cut down their salary by whatever. Look, we are running a system where people really don't care about what their salaries are. Look, do you think if the president were to say, look, um, going forward, no minister is going to be paid salary for one year. You think ministers will resign? How many ministers will resign? So that should tell you, look, people are not depending on, on their salaries. Why do you think that people will, retire, will resign from certain lucrative private you know, uh, businesses and private employment to jump into government employment? And then we are told, oh, the salary for where they are going now is about a third of what they were earning. That should tell you that people are grabbing positions, not just the salary, but the opportunities that are there for them to also get involved in acts that will let them get sometimes in one contract, perhaps 10 times or 20 times what they would, what they would get uh, in terms of their salary. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you know, um, CEOs, some CEOs are earning far more than the president, but whether or not, you know, uh, that those CEOs can fly in a chartered, luxurious flights around the world and spend how much is spent for these travels and so on is another matter. Mm. Whether or not those people can afford, you know, to, to travel with these uh, long convoys with a, a chair in one of the, you know, V8s and so on and so forth is another matter. Mm. So I think that we need to be very real. All right. We need so, to be, so, we so need Mr. Brahma, to, to, to the question, what does this mean for the future, uh, uh, the labor front? Because we have seen that this issue of neutrality allowance is creating some, uh, some confusion even among the worker unions. And, and if I may just add to what, what she, she says, uh, the likes of Dr. Uh, Stephen Ade have said that this is the most stupid thing they have ever heard. <laughs> That's uh, quoting him, uh, uh, Professor Ade, uh, and, and that is what he says. So is it, is it, I don't know how it rubs off you, but just to add that. Well, I think that, I think that the, the, the term is quite funny. And to think that there are government workers who say, because we are not allowed to do politics, we need something called neutrality allowance. I, I, I think they deserve more. Uh, if, you, if you learn about how much they earn, they certainly deserve more. But uh, whether that should come in the form of neutrality allowance is where the issue is. I think that that is an unrealistic term. That's an, that would be an unrealistic allowance. And therefore, 
even as they need to have more, they need to look at how they negotiate for better mm. increment and all of that. Mm. And so if Professor Adai says what he said, I think it's in principle about the term rather than their demand for more. Because in terms of um, fairness and equity, indeed, they need more. If, if uh, CEOs running organizations uh, into debts are being paid you know, tens of thousands of cities a month, then the people running our local governance system certainly deserves, deserves um, better than what they are having. Uh, Mr. Breimer, on, on that same bit about labor, I, I, we heard from the General Secretary of the TUC make mention of the fact that, look, our minimum wage is, is just about 80% of a liter of fuel. One liter of fuel is 80% of our minimum wage. So imagine someone who's on minimum wage. What can the person do with that? The president, in response, says, uh, but, but it is what it is. Uh, we are in this situation. Dr. Barr says, scrap all the taxes on petroleum products. And by the way, uh, we are told that LPG prices are going to drop, but the prices of petrol, the prices of diesel are going up again. So we're going to have to pay even more than we are seeing at the, at the pumps now. You put that side by side with what Mr. President says that we can't do that because we get some $4 billion from there. I mean... What is your take? Where do we strike the balance? Because ordinary people out there say they are suffering. Well, um, indeed, the suffering is real. I think we are all going through. Um, and, and if you want to be honest with yourself, you would say, look, if I'm earning 2000 or 3000 and I'm going through this, this kind of suffering, how about the person who is earning 700 or 800 a month? So that's real. And I think that when the president says that is what it is or that is what it has to be i i i share a different opinion i think it is what the president has made it to be it is what the president has made it to be because look i mean why would we be running at this country with this size of economy with a hundred or sometimes more than a hundred ministers with all the perks that goes to ministers everyone has to have a v8 um fueled by the state driven by someone paid by the state with you know free accommodation electricity water telephone and so on and so forth what is special about those people beyond the fact that they are mpp members whose party is in power and they get appointed by the president what is so unique what is so special about those people so if we are suffering let us suffer together if the economy can pay people fairly let us pay ourselves or pay people fairly. Why would we run this government machinery that is consuming so much when people are suffering? Why do we pay so much to state CEOs running organizations that are not contributing really anything to the development and growth of our country? Is it because you know they are party members, they contributed to a party and they must enjoy? And so uh, for me, it is what the president and the government of the day has made it to be, rather than what it has to be. And the equity, the fairness is something that we need to have a look at it. The other day, the president talked about our democracy being threatened. I think these are some of the fundamentals that then threaten our democracy. When inequality is rising, when people are seriously suffering, whilst others are really hmm. enjoying it, it comes down to, you know, um, confrontations, agitations, public debates, and so on, which then undermine the progress of our democracy. Mm. Once we're talking about this, let me just share an experience. Uh, there's this Uber I uh, used, and the driver was so upset. We were listening to the radio, and they were discussing these issues of unemployment. And he shares with me uh, his story, that a colleague of his got a government appointment and is building, putting up three structures in a prime area in this country. And then he, 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 he asks, within three or four years, why should he have that much? And the issue of the neutrality allowance, you know, backs this assertion that if you want to get rich quicker, then work for a party, work to bring a government into power, 
and then you get an appointment that will you know catapult you to to the next phase of your life and so this uh, demand by labor then also adds to to the whole assertion and gives it some credence that, well, if you want to be rich, then become a politician. How do we change the story? Well, I think that we, we essentially would need a, a leader who you know, comes in and would want to uh, change the dynamics, revolutionize how governance has been done in this country over the last 30 years or so, and to say, look, we need to build this country and to build this country, we need to, you know, really look at how we have done things. We cannot continue the, the, on the path where people finance a political party and when they come to power, then what they have to do is to, you know, reward themselves. We need to look at how contracts are being awarded. And we know about contracts that are, for example, take fumigation during COVID. It was really a contract to make people rich and to make people just squeeze resources from our state. Because uh, what are we fumigating against? Are we better at fumigating uh, than, let's say, China, than Spain, than right. Italy, where a lot of people were dying? They had mm -hmm. the resources, they had the capacity to do better than we are doing. I, I guess it raises questions as well, like people, some have asked about COVID-19 spending. Exactly. I mean, the transparency that is required, we are lacking it. And for me, it all comes down to leadership. And mm. let us, as Ghanaians, be bold to speak truth to power. I think that is what develops a country. Let us, as Ghanaians, not be selfish. Don't let us look at, oh, if I say this against the MPP, an opportunity that could have come my way would be missed. If I say this against the NDC, an opportunity that could come my way when they are in power would be missed. If we do that, I don't think that we would be helping the development of this country. And people have said, oh, as civil society organizations and as journalists, you need to demonstrate neutrality. Yes, that is true. But what is neutrality? I don't believe that neutrality is about watching on when state resources are being planted, watching on when taxes uh, uh, that are so obnoxious are being imposed, when you know, people are cooking figures and Auditor General reports year on year indicates that billions are going into the pockets of people. Mm -hmm. And then you watch on in the name of neutrality. I don't think that will be neutrality. That will be condoning, you know, what is happening. And until we, especially those of us who would call ourselves you know, young, middle-aged or whatever, begin to speak truth to power, I believe that we would continue to see what we are seeing. NDC would come one day and they may do worse. MPP would win again and they would continue to do worse. So what would get us to change the status quo? is for us as citizens to begin to speak truth to power, say things as they are, and be real. And forget about being afraid that one will be tagged, you know, you are not neutral, you are not independent, you are MPP, you are NDC, and so on and so forth. That is what will help this country. But for someone to say, what has talking down for us? I mean, just think about the e-levy, for example, on, on online, you know, <laughs> on radio, on television, everywhere. People were registered. We conducted polls, Bernice, uh, mm -hmm. in the Ashanti region, where nine out of ten people said they were against it. Here we are. And, and still, you know, government found a way to, to, to pass it, to have it implemented. So, I mean, talking truth to power, do you think that alone can help us change the status quo? Well, um, the, the, the implementation has started. They have found their way. We had our say, but they had their way. Now, uh, they promised us that with E-Levy, schools will be built, you know, um, children sitting under trees will not happen anymore, our roads will be tied, tiled, um, unemployment will be a thing of the past, and so on. Yes, they've had their way. Let us now demand what they promised that E-Levy would do. We know very well that, as usual, they were deceiving the people. They were, you know, trying to say whatever it is that will get the people to buy in. Unfortunately, on this occasion, people did not buy in. People had their say, they had their way, but they promised us, let us continue to demand. I believe that the transformation we all look for, the good governance that we are lacking, we will not have it in a day. But certainly, if we continue to persist, one day we would have a leader who would say, look, the people are now 
well aware of their rights, well aware of their, you know, their responsibilities, and well aware of what they have to do as citizens. And we cannot continue to take them for granted. If we want this country to continue to run in the uh, peaceful manner that we have had over the years, I don't think that the way to go is for government to always abuse its power, have its way, and continue to perpetrate the fraudulent things that we have always seen over the years. Let's continue to have our way. Let's continue to speak truth to power. If for nothing at all, that is what brings government down and brings government in. And those who may come may know that they came to power not because people liked them, but because people hated what their predecessors were doing. And therefore, if they continue to do what their predecessors, predecessors did, they would certainly also be kicked out just as their uh, predecessors were kicked out. This whole phenomenon of when are we going to have a situation where a government comes to power and in four years they are out of power? I think one day we'll get to that point where governments will realize it is not, it's no longer eight years, eight years. Mm. If for nothing at all, what happened in 2020, I believe was a signal to have had, you know, the parliament that we have now certainly is a signal that the people are well awake and mm. politicians and people in leadership cannot take them for granted forever. Mm. Suleiman, so, so uh, do tell, uh, th there's an interesting diamond that I make to this because we're talking about leadership. And on the back of Elon Musk uh, taking over Twitter and all of that, he posted recently, you know him, he throws a lot of jokes out there, but you never know what he's serious about. And he posted that he was going to buy Coca-Cola and put the cocaine, so to speak, back. And per what I've heard, uh, some 3.5 grams of cocaine was actually in the first bottle of, but no longer, no longer. So Coca-Cola, don't come after me. But that is what Elon posted. Then we had a prominent citizen, Dr. Kofi Amwa, citizen Kofi, come and retort that, oh, Elon, I have a better idea. Come and buy Africa and delete all our leaders. Delete them. <laughs> What do you think? It, it brings to mind what Mo Ibrahim said some time back about leadership of a certain type and even the age. And, and I'm not being ageist here, but it's the reality. You look at France and the age even now in a second term of their, of their leader and so many other countries. And he asks, where are leaders taking us? To the grave? Um, I don't know. Just, just for you to digest. Well, um, first of all, in terms of the age um, debates, the last time I was having an argument with someone and the person said, oh, um, I don't think that, in quotes, I don't think that we have to vote for an old person again. Yeah. And my question was, who is old? President Mahama, at the time uh, he assumed office, wasn't somebody that we would describe as old. But did we have the kind of leadership that we, we deserved as a country from him? My answer would be no. He could have done far better. And so I don't think that it comes out to the question of age. I think it is about someone who has a determination to live a legacy, to, to want to be remembered for great things that he did and not to be remembered as somebody who also came and just basically did what others um, had, to, had to do. In terms of the uh, very um, um, maybe jovial comments that um, Elon should buy Africa and delete our leaders, well, I think that was just for, for, for joke. But look, you and I know that the kind of effort that people put in to be able to travel out of this country to the West, it has given people cause to say, look, if all of a sudden we wake up one day and we hear, oh, there are ships on the shores and they are looking for slaves, to America and so on and so forth. Look, people would, would voluntarily say, we would want to be in the US. Suleiman, I don't go too far. On the back of what is happening between Ukraine and Russia, some people have queued. I'm sure you are aware. Yes. And not just in Ghana, yes. in other countries, Kenya and others wanting to leave our continent for those yeah, countries. I, I, and, and that should tell us a lot. And, and if our leaders are genuine, in a, if our leaders would want to be remembered as we remember leaders like Kwame Nkrumah for what they did over a six year period or so, you know, and then we have had leaders who 
stay in power for eight years, they leave and you have really nothing to remember them for um, their, their leadership. If at all, it is just about all the, the, the trivialities of how many schools have been built and how many hospitals have been built rather than the transformational things. Kwame Nkrumah, who, who talks about how many schools Nkrumah built and so on and so forth as his record? It is about the kinds of things that he puts in place that become so transformational. When you build schools, every government builds schools. And these days, I believe that every, every minister would want to execute projects sometimes for what comes with it. Because, I mean, without that, is it your salary that you're going to depend on and so on and so forth? Right. So I think that leaders in Africa must, must reflect. When they meet uh, together, they must reflect and ask themselves. Oh, too bad. Too bad it appears the fee there. I, I have to do this before we go. So there's someone watching, Martin George, um, and he says, wow, I love your beautiful madam. I can't stop watching her. Martin George, yes, she is uh, her pulchritude. Uh, but she's also very married. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's you know, before, before we go on to, uh, to do sports, let me, let, let me just mention that the, the president, during his address yesterday to workers, mentioned that the uh, Ministry of Employment and Labor Rel Relations has set up a technical committee mm. uh, to look into the single yeah. spine. Uh, How long policy. will we look into that spine yeah. before we get into I, that? I, I know, right? That, because, that particular boom yeah. that he's giving us. So he, he's saying that, they need answers uh, as to whether the policy should be maintained or you know, there should be. So, and that's just by way of information. But we have Suleiman Abraima back. Sorry, we lost you there, sir. So just uh, quickly wrap up on what you were saying. Well, so, um, uh, just to wrap up on this whole issue about salaries and all, uh, I think it's really unfair that we live in a country where people get into politics, uh, be in parliament, and for every four years, they get fat as gracious and go away with, and I have, you know, uh, Oof. it appears we've lost uh, the feed go. again. So we have to go yeah. uh, for sports. But this, this story on the BBC caught my attention, just to wrap. Children drank rainwater from puddles to survive. That is in Ukraine. And I was just thinking, while we, you know, feel for them, this is a, a normal, regular situation in mm -hmm. Yawini, mm -hmm. in the eastern region and other parts of the country. You have people drinking muddy water. And, and that is something we really ought to look at 64 years after independence. Too anyway. bad. I mean, I don't like talking about these things, uh, especially when you travel to, to the northern parts of the country. It's very disheartening. You know, like, like Suleiman was asking, you wonder if people live in a different Ghana. I think that it's something that people should try to do. And I mean, quickly linked to that also is how, as a country, we don't do a lot to maintain our resources for those of us who are down south. You know, people open their taps, use water anyhow. You know, in, in the UK, for example, there's effort to preserve water. And so when you buy products, you see it yeah. labeled there, yeah. and like, you know, things that will require that you use water, like even a common toothpaste. They write it there, save water, use water. You know, uh, judiciously. So, even suggesting that you can do the brushing without water, water and, just and then the rinse your in. mouth. So, I just think that we as a people should be, you know, should concentrate more on the things that matter. Yeah. You know, human dignity. Mm. It's important. How do people drink water that's not treated? I don't know. For some time now, the, the water is getting better. Ghana Water Company Limited initially was terrible. Terrible, terrible. The quality of water uh, we were getting served. But now I, I see, even when you open the taps, you yeah. smell that yeah. there are chemicals in it now. Yeah. There's some treatment. So but it's also it on goes. the back of Galamsey, and it's making them use even more uh, chemicals. But I do agree. What happened to that fight? Penny, you know, it brings to mind the expression, pennywise pound foolish. What happened to the fight against Galamsey? Uh, should I tell you? Do I even yeah. know? Let's go and do some sports. Let's get into sports. We'll be back. Welcome back on the AM show and we're asking you, have you paid your e-levy yet? 
Have you attempted any transaction and been hit uh, by the e-levy? Uh, did you send less than 100 CDs and were you hit by it? Like a lot of people have shared with us. Share your experience with us. We'd love to hear from you on the AM show. The hashtag is AM show. Uh, on the last leg of the show, uh, from nine onwards, we'll also activate the phone lines as well, so you can call and share your thoughts on these matters. But joining us in the studio as we talk about the implementation and the process so far, Isaac Kobana Amwako is Head Project Management at the GRA. We also have Eli Hine, CEO, Mobile Money Limited. Uh, both of them join the conversation as we talk about where we are and where we hope to be when it comes to uh, the e-levies implementation. Uh, we'll also later be joined by engineer Dr. Ken Ashibe, and we all know the role he plays, Chamber of Telecommunications. But thank you, uh, gentlemen, for joining thank us you. in the studio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so where do we start from? Let me start with you, Isaac. You are the implementers. Uh, well, no, I don't know. Oh, the, the whole works of it. You are the engineering guys, ensuring that everything goes through. Uh, I'll start from day one of implementation, May the 1st, and all the concerns, I'm sure, came your way as the GRA. What has the rollout been like for you? Thank you very much. Um, so for GRA, um, um, day one, we started uh, monitoring the uh, comments and complaints from the public. Um, as we are aware, um, the concerns that have come is uh, mainly in two categories. Um, off net um, um, transfers to same person as um, receiving charges, uh, which we, during our simulation, we are aware that that will happen. And um, we've shared some guidelines on how to reverse those um, legitimate uh, uh, transfers that are not supposed to um, attract the levy. How widespread um, are these? Uh, we, we wouldn't know the numbers now, the charging entities by close of day um, or in the course of the week as they interact with us, they will give us the, those um, transaction types. Yes, but I was even asking in respect of the dissemination of information that you, how, how widespread is that information? How many people have you been able to reach? You know, with the problems that you spoke of, you said that you have started a process of disseminating information about No, the, the dissemination can... of the information is related to, it relates to the charging entities, not to the general okay, public. Okay, so not yeah. to the general public. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so we deal directly with the charging entities. Right. Yeah. So in, in that respect, we've sent them a circular earlier on how to um, handle reversals. Okay. Because we anticipated that once we are all not connected to the common platform, um, when you send across to another network, to the same person, you won't have visibility. And for that matter, those uh, charges would apply. But that is the more reason why we've come out with a guideline on how to do those reversals. Yeah, the, the second category also relate to that same off net where uh, people are sending below 100 Ghana and they are still being charged. That also have come to our attention and we are in communication with the charging entity to look into that. So the charging entities here would be the telcos? Um, it would be telcos, banks, PSPs, and then the specialized deposit taking institutions. These are the four categories of charging entities we are looking at here. Blunt question, why is that happening? Because we were told, I mean, we know the categories of people who are supposed to be hit by the 1.5%. And yesterday we had people even in-house, you know, just attempt because we wanted to be sure what the process was like. Sent 10 CDs, 20 CDs, 50 CDs, and yet they were being charged 1.5%. Why is that happening? Okay, so our engagement with the charging entities, we were going to go what we call in project management, big bank, where um, everybody was expected by first me to connect to a common platform and start charging using the common platform. But um, at the last minute, we realized that some of the charging parties um, came to us that they needed that kind of extension so they can fully um, configure their system to connect to the common platform. So the minister allowed that we shouldn't connect to the common platform by first mail. We should allow all the charging entities to do the charging on their own platforms. So currently what is happening is that the charging is taking place at each of the charging entities' own system and not through a common system as we have envisaged. So you may... Right, so I get it. It's not a common platform where all of them are feeding into it, but individually they are doing their own thing. Yes, yes. So that is why. So you, you are the mercy of a charging entity system. So if the system hasn't been fully configured at their end, 
then we see some of these challenges. Uh, this full configuration, was that not to have been done before we you know, initiate the process? Because some people raised red flags that we weren't ready for the execution. Uh, politicians, um, uh, technical people, uh, they, they raised concerns. So wh why then, if we were not this ready, why then did we roll out on May the 1st? So in project management, you have so many options to choose from, depending on how complex your system is and the kind of um, simulation that you've gone through. So our earlier simulation is that we're doing a full big bank, um, true stakeholder engagement. Um, they made feedback that we should give them some time before we go the full bank. Um, that has been adhered to. So we are now envisaging to go full um, blown somewhere July 1st. So once they are charging from their individual systems, this is something that when you simulate, we envisage that it will happen. And that is the more reason why the guideline has also been developed mm. for this um, um, approach. Let me ask you a, a blunt question before I come to um, uh, Mr. Elihine. Uh, so what would you say our state of readiness was? Looking at the, the parts that we've not yet fully integrated and all of that, what would you say on a, on a scale of one to 100, was our level of preparedness or readiness for the execution of this, I'm, I'm thinking of seamlessly, seamlessly. On, the, on May the 1st, what was our state of readiness? So it's, it's conditional. Originally, as I said, we were going a big bank and then we changed the strategy to what we call modified phased approach. So we are now implementing a modified phase approach. We've gone day one, um, we received some kind of feedback. Um, this feedback is expected. And I believe day two, um, within this week, corrective actions will take place. To, yeah, to yes, but I would like a fair idea. As, as the implementers, I'm sure on day one, you knew that our state of readiness is maybe 60% or 90% or 100%, but, but it wouldn't be 100 because of some of the things you're mentioning. So I just want to know, if, if you had to give it a number, where, where were we? I just want to know so that moving forward, we know that maybe we have to catch up on another 15% or 10% or 20%, and, and by July, those loose ends will be tied. I, I believe that question shouldn't arise now because I've told you, um, if you cannot measure something, you can't manage it, all right? Um, the one that allows us that full visibility would be the common platform. We are not implementing common platform as a first mate. We are doing um, what we call modified approach. It is at the instance of each of the charging parties. So if you want me to go and measure, we, we are dealing with more than 300 charging entities to um, pick a, a statistic on each one and say that each one should be 100% before I go live. Probably it will take us a long time to go. So the strategy is that, okay, who owns the majority um, shares of the population that we are dealing with? Why don't we categorize the top 20 and um, check the readiness of the top 20. So we did that. We, we, we simulated with the top 20. And some of the top 20 gave us that, look, by 1st May, we can't connect to the common platform. Can you give us some time? So we, we erred on the side of those with majority of the population that will be um, affected. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, um, that has informed this modified approach. Right. It's interesting uh, that you say that because I interacted with Deputy Finance Minister Dr. John Kuma before the rollout, 48 hours to the rollout, and he said we were 95% you know, ready and that on the day of the rollout, May the 1st, we'll be 100% ready. Interesting. Uh, but let me come to Mr. Lee Hinney. Uh, from your end, how, is, how has it been so far, the implementation of the e-levy, and what has it meant for business? Well, uh, thank you very much. I think for us, um, like uh, Isaac mentioned, we've been working at this since the announcement um, of the E-Levy implementation uh, by the Honorable Minister. And in the process, we've had several engagements looking at what we seek to do, the scope of work. And um, like he, he said, the initial um, discussions was for us to look at a phased approach so that we take one uh, 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 bit of the project at a time. And so essentially we worked uh, with that in mind and uh, put our resources to try and prepare for the phased approach. But um, post the passage of the bill, uh, we had some further engagement and the view was to look at the more holistic approach, like um, 
<clears throat> Mr. Marco said. And so we moved to look at that and did a lot of the work, committed resources and everything. Uh, and like he said, I mean, along the way, uh, we, we had to also review our level of readiness. And uh, once we did that, we realized that going the full approach um, at the time will, will be um, a challenge. And so we needed to pause and look at what level of preparedness and what can be implemented. Well, what so, were some of the challenges? Well, we, we needed, he talked about the common platform. And so you needed to be connected to the common platform. Um, you needed to check all the necessary requirements based on the project scope. And once you were not able to deliver on the specific requirements, because the common platform role was to do everything else that um, in this phased approach we, we are looking at, which means that you send requests, it does the computation of the tax, it gives you back feedback, and then you proceed to commit the transaction. So once we could not achieve that level of readiness, we needed to look at our implementation uh, from what uh, he's referred to as a modified uh, approach, because that is where we can um, get some uh, implementation running for the committed uh, start date of uh, May 1. And so on our side, um, like um, he indicated, we knew um, what um, the issues were uh, and what to expect. And so I would say overall it's been a very uh, good uh, start. And the issues that came uh, with big projects like this, you should expect that there will be issues, minor issues here and there with specific complaints. Because I'm not sure everybody had the same problem. And people did transactions, they didn't have any concerns, everything went through. Others did have issues. So we pick up the issues after day one, and then we begin to apply the fixes and solutions. More importantly, in instances where people have been wrongly charged their levy, we do... And I was about to get to that. Yeah, we do refunds. And so... So, so you, when you say you do refunds, I mean, we started yesterday. Yes. Have you refunded anybody's money to them? No. Usually, after day one, um, this morning we are looking at the reports and then picking up the, the anomalies, uh, as in the wrong uh, deductions that may have occurred. Mm -hmm. And then once we pick that one, we run the report and he, he indicated a process um, that will be followed for people to be refunded. Um, I'll come to you shortly, Mr. Marco, for you to maybe walk us through that process, what people ought to do when they are wrongly, because there's a process and if you don't, you, you might end up. Uh, but, but so how widespread has this been? As CEO of Mobile Money Limited, can you tell me after day one, how widespread were these wrong deductions? Well, uh, for now, it will only be um, the complaints we picked on social media. But like I mentioned, the report itself will be churned out this morning. I mean, I had to come straight uh, right. from home, so I haven't had the opportunity to look at anything. So but you've not seen maybe the paper trail of, oh, yesterday, X no, number of no, people no, actually I sent will, through? I will be able to speak to that later this morning when I've right. looked at the report. I haven't seen the report yet. But, but from what you saw on social media, how concerned are you about the, the number of people, because even individually, mm -hmm. a number of people would reach out to you with screenshots, and I can show you yeah. from my phone. Yeah. You know, then you come to our platforms, yeah. WhatsApp and all yeah. of that, you see a lot of yeah. them dropping, yeah. Yeah. and then you have people that you, you can guarantee, you can vouch for, say, okay, you, you send it to, and then they tell you, okay, I'm sending 20 CDs, but Charlie, I make slap to it, 1.5% mm -hmm. and all of yeah. that. Yeah, so, um, I, I think for, just to try and, um, and, and situate the conversations, um, he talked about the off-net, where you are doing a transaction onto um, another platform where you don't have visibility. And so if indeed that person ought not to be charged on the other side, you will not know. And so like he mentioned, those are things we envisaged that would come up. That's why the process to also put in a refund process to deal with those instances as they come. And also to add, I mean, the transactions we process are in hundreds of thousands and sometimes in, 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 in millions. So specific issues may come up, but by the time you run that against the overall activity, it, the representation may be um, a very uh, small percentage of the overall. But they are all important because those are individual concerns that we need to address. So this morning, once we pick up the report, 
we'll be able to tell, okay, X percentage where, where we picked up the issues. But in fairness, because we knew that we were implementing across platforms or across network where we didn't have visibility and we don't have the benefit of the common platform, the issue of the um, tax being misapplied or people being charged literally when they are not supposed to be charged because we don't have visibility on that may arise but we just need to understand the number of instances that ha that happen and we also know that interoperability or transactions cross network uh, is a portion of our overall transactions uh, but the transactions on net which is where we have comfort and have put in all the uh, implementation solutions is the bulk of it so from here we can say the bulk should not be the problem the, the smaller part would be, and out of even that smaller part, the individual circumstances may determine what the issues are. And once we look at the report this morning, we'll be in a better place. And then going forward, we are better prepared on how to address these issues and make sure that we, we smoothen the process uh, very quickly. Mr. Hene, a uh, quick one before I come back to you, Mr. Amoko, for the process. That, that's what I, I want to come back to you on. But uh, so uh, those who have been affected, is there a way they could eventually lose their money completely? You, you, you can't no, get it back. No, no. First of all, let's understand what the issue is. So you intend to send money to me some, uh, on, on another platform. So you send the money. I've received the money. What we are talking about is I shouldn't have charged 1.5%. Exactly. So that 1.5% is the refund. So that is what we are talking about. So that is where the report would pick up and the refunds will be implemented. So, 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 so is this an automatic system then? Or that is the, but, but, does there need to be a trigger? A, a trigger in the sense of, so I sent 20 CDs. You deducted 1.5%, which you shouldn't have. Uh, but I don't report or anything of the sort. How will I get my money back? Will my money come back to me yes. automatically? Yes, that's why I'm saying there's a report that would indicate these. We pick that report and we do the refund. However, there may also be instances where someone may have been charged correctly on our side, which we won't pick up. That person will now say, yes, even though you charge me correctly, the receiving wallet is mine. And you know, if you are sending to your own wallet, we shouldn't uh, charge you the tax. So on our side, it will be legitimate. So we will not pick that. So it will now be for the customer now to flag and say, Yes, you charge me correctly, but because it's to my own wallet, you need to give me a refund. And when that customer comes to make a complaint, that customer's complaint will now be taken on board, validated, and the refund done. However, there is a caveat which the Commissioner General has put there, that if in the concluding processes of the common platform becoming effective, Mm -hmm. and we do the reconciliation, and we realize that that complaint you made was actually a false complaint because we can't tell you will be held liable as a... As, as Where a, liability will mean what? That Criminal you, charges? What, what, well, what? that will be the determination of the Commissioner General because essentially what we are saying is that even though you came to say those, that wallet belonged to you, it actually didn't belong to you. And so you have made a false claim. So those instances may also arise. And that is actually... A responsibility of that individual but for the regular ones that we picked that we are and uh, agree that these were anticipated and we've picked it those ones will be um, 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 refunded without the customer's intervention all right so, so someone is hit by 1.5 percent <laughs> and they are feeling ah but but let me send a no it doesn't it doesn't warrant a 1.5 percent what processes must the person go through? And, and again, are you reinforcing, because we had a bit of a confab before coming on air, do people have to physically state that, hey, you've charged me 1.5%, you shouldn't have charged me, or automatically the system will take care of it, or do we have to wait for integration in June, July, full integration? Um, thank you. So he's already answered part of this uh, concern that for those that were not supposed to be charged, you're below 100, you're sending off net. Ordinarily, you weren't supposed to be charged. When they run the report, it will flag those ones. And those ones, the customer needs not make any complaint. It would be refunded automatically. But for the ones that they don't have visibility, if you don't come and complain that the other end, the account belongs to me, 
I am the owner and bring the proof that you are the owner. How do you expect anybody to know? No one so would so, so which, which, what are some examples? You say so, like the ones without so much visibility. So let's give Break an it example. down. Um, you're sending um, 100 cities from MTN to your own Vodafone wallet and you own the Vodafone wallet right. and you get charged. That shouldn't have been charged because the Vodafone wallet belongs to you. Mm. So that is the type of transaction you should make a complaint to MTN. Call the uh, call center and tell the call center that I made a transaction to my own wallet and I got charged. They will ask you for the details. You give the transaction ID, they probably will ask you for your ID, the ID to confirm that indeed it's yours, you provide it. Then within the time that they have always agreed with customers that when such complaints are made, they will get your feedback. They will, they will go through that internal mechanism and if it is legitimate, your money gets refunded back to you. If, if past experience is anything to go by. I still have some 20 cities locked up with a telco whose name I will not mention because I tried to bundle. They couldn't effect the thing. This is from years ago. I called them so many times and just gave up. I'm sure if I invested those 20 cities by now, I would have made some interest. But that tells you that what I'm trying to draw here, the nexus is that if that could happen then, it could also happen with this. So, I mean, the, the staffing or the strength of these telcos when it comes to uh, customer service and, and those people you would call has not changed. So don't you feel that in this instance, and, and maybe it would be addressed to you as well, we could have a similar situation where you, you make the call all right and all of that, but what, what, what is the guarantee that you, you will get your refund? That's my, that's my concern. Okay, maybe let me take that. Um, today, all money operations, um, refunds or reversals um, are part of the process. And when customers have made legitimate um, requests for refund and reversals, it, it's addressed. But there's one other thing which we always try and flag when we have these conversations, is the fact that people will genuinely make a payment. So let's say you've made a, a payment to a merchant. You turn around and call us to say that it was a wrong transaction. We would have to confirm with that merchant whether indeed it's a wrong transaction. So if the merchant now comes back to say, no, you bought goods and paid for it, then there is something we need to resolve. And therefore, that process has to be fully investigated before a refund is done. But where it is legitimate, the first request you make, what happens is that we hold the funds on the other side and then we follow up to engage the other side to say, this was a wrong transaction, and therefore we'll go ahead. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to temper with it, nothing. We will do the reversal to the recipient. And I can tell you that we do that every day, and there are teams who have been specifically recruited to handle that. So I can understand the challenge with bundles that may have happened in the past, but in the process which we have today, and we appreciate people and their uh, financial uh, needs, we ensure that once it's a legitimate claim, we make the refund. And refunds are done on a regular basis. So I, I can uh, promise you that these are things we take very seriously. I, I, I sometimes tell my, my colleagues that someone in, uh, will have um, value on his airtime, but he will not tr give you that kind of pressure with that same value on his mobile money wallet. So you need to ensure that when you are dealing with money, yeah. you are giving people what you have committed to. So within our committed um, reversal process, um, that um, uh, specific action is taken. So we would ensure, especially in instances where we ourselves have predicted that it will happen because we knew that we could not tell what was happening on the other side, those re uh, refund processes will be executed. That is a commitment. We do, do, do hold for me, Mr. Marco. I'll come back to you on the process the processes to be followed by anyone who feels aggrieved that they have been wrongly uh, charged. But don't forget our question for you uh, today as well. We want to find out, have you transacted Momo uh, below 100 CDs? How is it, what has the experience been like? Have you been affected? And if over 100 CDs, is everything working okay? We've also seen some people suggest that they are transacting you know, over 100 CDs and they are not being charged. That is also there. So it's, it's an interesting mix. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. 
But let me also bring in uh, Dr. Engineer Dr. Kenneth Ashikbech, uh, CEO of the Chamber of Telecommunications. Uh, Doc, a very good morning to you, sir. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? I am doing very well. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Uh, what will be your assessment of the e-levy after day one? Well, I think so far uh, for such a, a big project, uh, it started quite well uh, in terms of uh, getting the phased implementation started. That's happened. But as a project management person, you know that you know, there'll be teething challenges that would come. There'll be learnings that will be picked up. And so that, that is going on after the first full day of running it, um, as Ellie had mentioned you will pick up all the various reports that you have been picking up during the day, consolidate them, do an analysis of them, uh, the, the ones that you need to tweak uh, systems you would do. Um, and then the most important thing is that amongst us, you know, all the charging entities and uh, GRA, there's a lot of communication going on so that uh, before even they end, if there are issues that we need to speak about, we're doing that and we are picking the feedback that is coming and it's good that today uh, Joy News has us and we are able to engage with Ghanaians on the process so far. Speaking of uh, engagement, education, you had your own concerns about the one-month window before the implementation of the e-levy. Uh, on the level of education, uh, do you think we are there yet? And if not, what more must be done? I mean, to the extent that we had the Mobile Money Agents Association of Ghana stepping in uh, to uh, th that is just on the 30th of April to clarify certain things even for Momo agents or mobile money agents because they themselves had problems. Some were confused about whether they were going to have to take the 1.5% and all of that. It, ap it appears to be a bit chaotic in that sense. So uh, on the level of education, how far have we come? How far do we have to go? Well, I think the education... Um it's going to be an ongoing process uh, because of all the work that had to be done and you needed to finish uh, all the technical things before you can complete it. And because of the online engagement between the charging entities, and you should understand the plethora of charging entities, several of them, and the scenarios are so many. Um, you wanted to finalize everything before uh, uh, education was really completed. But some level of education had started, and we need to continue it. We need to deepen it. And the interesting thing is that it's, we're going to be using above the line and below the line, uh, you know, methods to do it. So engagement like this with, you know, on your media platform, as well as one-on-one -on -one with the various uh, uh, call centers have been set up. All the charging entities have call centers, DRA themselves also have call centers. And then engagement with stakeholders like uh, the Mobile Money Association is something that is also going to continue. And so we, we for such a complex project, uh, you are going to be picking up learnings and you're going to be passing that on. You need to have alignments, you know, and all of that is really going to continue. So um, I agree that we need to push the education and that's, going to, that's a commitment that we have uh, to continue educating uh, ourselves educating customers and all those who are within the value chain. Uh, let, let, on, on the same bit of education, I mean, I'm looking at a post on Twitter by Professor Eric Oting Abeye, and he cites something crucial. It, it's not just individuals and it's not just mobile money agents. It is even banks. Now he cites here, and of course, I'm not going to mention which bank, but he says some banks are getting it right, but others are not on the, on the bit of what the rate to apply is, how the levy will be applied, who is responsible for charging, what transactions fall under the e-levy e and all of that. H how is that possible? I mean, if, if banks themselves uh, do not have a full grasp of this per their communications with ordinary citizens, then it is indeed a mess, isn't it? Well, I'm not too sure. You see, the, the thing about it is the fact that the banks uh, are having part of the, uh, the conversation and they, you know, throughout, and they know with what we finally have agreed. They know what it is that is going to be done. But we should also bear in mind, uh, in the quest to be able to start the education early, some communication was put out earlier on. And then once you engage amongst yourself and <clears throat> uh, something is changed, 
A new one, a revised one will be issued, but the old ones are out. I have seen, for example, FAQs that were issued by uh, GRE that have been superseded, but people are still sharing them as if they are the new ones. So there's also that cleanup that has to be done. And one of the things that we all agreed uh, with GRE, who are leading, you know, they are the regulator for the collection of the taxes, is that once they supersede it, they'll be dating it. So one of the things I would urge all of us is that when we're seeing the communication, let's look at the dates that are on them, you know, so that if it's predated, you see that the, the, the new ones will have current dates. So all of those things are happening. But the other thing about it is that these are digital transactions. So the digital footprints are all there. Uh, in these early stages, if there are any of these challenges, you know, they, there's a possibility to be able to do them. So it has to be Kaizen. It has to be a continuous improvement. It has to be, you know, learn, taking learning and making sure that we are agile in terms of the way these things, uh, you know, are dealt with. So we would definitely, and that's the commitment from all of us, including the banks, including the PSP, the EMI. All of us uh, in GRE and the Ministry of Finance, we are all committed into working on this particular thing and making sure that all the rough edges, you know, are, are dealt with. So it is a, an ongoing process. That is clear. And uh, any projects manager will also walk you through that, just like Mr. Marco uh, in the studio has. But interesting question. I, I'm just curious before we move on. Uh, as of D-Day, May the 1st, how ready would you say we were in terms of implementation? On a scale so of you, 1 to 100, where would you place us? I, I would not put a number to it, you see, because uh, the reason I won't put a number to it is that there are very, so there's the EMIs that are involved, there are the banks that are involved, you also have the PSP that are involved, the savings, the loan companies that are also involved, and the level of readiness for all of them might be slightly different. And so, um, but what I, and I think it was a good decision taken to have the phased approach. And with the phased approach, and I'm sure as uh, Isaac and Ellie would have explained, because we had been working on all of that, the systems were generally ready. You know that Microsoft has been at the act of, you know, de 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 developing their operating system. But the operating system, you keep on getting new versions decades if after they've done. So definitely the most important thing is that how do we pick the learnings out of that and how do we fix it and how do we continue to engage the consumer? That is really going to be critical. And that's one thing that all of us, including our regulator and the policymaker, the Minister of Finance, the Ministry of Finance, we are all committed to doing and making sure that we're carrying all guardians along that particular journey. I've spoken to Dr. John Kumar, Deputy Finance Minister. He has said by, I mean, he mentioned that by June, uh, full integration would have happened with the, tech, with the telcos uh, so that they can do better when it comes to a seamless execution of the e-levy. I'm told now July, uh, per some of those in the studio. Between now and then, uh, what do you see happening with the telcos to bring about this seamlessness? And so what I, would you like to see? So I think the first thing is that it's not the telcos, it's the electronic money issuer. The right. telcos are the completely EMIs. different. Aha. So, yes, we will continue to push for those July deadline uh, to make sure that, that the integrations are done. One of the things that all of us, you know, in one of the meetings with the Minister of Finance and GRA is the commitment to deploy extra resources. Already extra resources have been deployed. This project is one of the first that Ghana is going to do. Because of government's quest to ensure that the marginalized are really not negatively impacted, you know, so there's a lot of exemptions that have been introduced there. And then and also because of the pure nature, especially when it comes to the EMI, mobile money, the complexity and the, you know, the, the number of scenarios that you have, uh, it would require a lot of work. But there is commitment to ensure that that is done. And so we would push to ensure that by the July, when we, um, you know, we are fully integrated, the learnings that we are picking with this phased approach would also improve that. And the user experience for the customer is going to improve. The thing I can promise is the fact that it's something that you're going to see get better day in, day, you know, day in after as we go along this particular journey. Uh, did you make any transactions as of yesterday, uh, as I wrap with you? Did you make yes, any I transactions? Did. I, yes, I did. Uh, what 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 happened in there? Any any false uh, deductions? Any anything that wasn't kosher? 
Well, I know. I, no, I for me, I had done most of, uh, most of my deductions. My transactions have been on that. Interestingly, we had lost um, one of our classmates has lost a father, and so we had been collecting donations, and we had had to pay it. And I think that there's only one that uh, cross net that uh, because it was sent uh, from a particular network to another network that was sad, but I knew that was going to happen. So. Uh, that uh, that one I am going to apply for the refund. What you see, that what has happened is that the so, IT so you had, had a refund situation in, yesterday. Pardon? You, so you had a refund situation yesterday. Yes, definitely. Yes, there's one refund situation I had yesterday. How much did you send? Uh, on which you? Oh, you know, you know, Chief. I will not tell you what the Absunians are doing. Uh, so, but definitely it was something because it was about somebody's. It was quite uh, a hefty amount. Sizable, so, eh? Yes, quite sizable, yes. Okay. If you have any concluding comments, this would be the time to uh, say them because when I come in, we'll be wrapping the conversation too. Well, I just want to say well, we're very grateful to Joy News for this. Okay. And I am also very grateful to the collaboration that we've had with the Ministry of Finance and GRE and the rest of us, the bank, uh, the EMI, everybody working together. Um, our appeal to Ghanaians is that this is a major project that we're doing. We've just started it. The challenges are going to come. The feedback is important. When there's any challenge, they should reach out to their, uh, their mobile money uh, or their banks, uh, you know, for resolution. It would be dealt with if there's anything else they, they need as well. The GRE has a call center as well. They should reach out to them. And okay. uh, like we've been doing on a daily basis, when we, we, we sit down in the evening to analyze them, all of this feedback would be also taken and dealt with. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are grateful to you for joining the conversation. Thank you, sir. And that thank is um, engineer Dr. Kenneth Ashikbe, uh, CEO of Ghana Chamber of Telecommunications. So is yours an EMI? I, I just yes. need some clarity. Yes. So you are the EMI? Yes, we are for the EMI. A certain Electronic uh, money issuers. Great. Yeah. So now th th there's some clarity on yeah. that bit. So you are operating on their behalf. Is that, is that, I mean, I want to get the dynamics of how it works because well, I'm sure the, those the, listening, the, 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 we all have a yeah, bit of an the, understanding. The, 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 the money but issu issuing institutions are mm. institutions that have been set up to run the mobile money uh, right. business. And these institutions have a um, uh, relationship with the telco. So right. they are um, subsidiaries that have been set up, but mm. independently to run the mobile money business. Uh, so walk us through the process of what people can do if, if they are aggrieved in this instance. What do they have to do? So the aggrieved uh, um, method they should use is to um, contact their existing customer center for their charging entities. So okay. if you are an MTN customer, we expect you to use the MTN um, customer helpline. I believe it's 100. And then you complain that you made a lawful uh, transfer. You provide the transaction ID. They take your details and provide you a ticket and then I believe they will ask you for the ID um, you can provide a, any national ID um, in the modified approach we are accepting any national ID in the any national ID any national so, ID. so what what, any what falls ID. into the category voters voters driver's passport, license driver's license Ghana card Ghana passport, card, passport. Um, but in the July one it would be strictly Ghana card, Ghana card. in the modified approach we are accepting any national ID so we provide I mean, that is, uh, the telcos can talk about it um, more. The details that you provide, and they will have time to go through. And then if it is valid, it will be refunded. So you must do this to safeguard your money, yes. not take any risks and okay. assume that automatically everything will be done. That, this won't be automatic. When you are sent to your staff, okay. which you are not supposed to be charged off net, you need to call and provide the details so that they will log it in their uh, um, customer complaint logs. Mm. Uh, do share with me, though, there have been some concerns about an Elmas uh, system uh, that the GRA has uh, been working with. Uh, what is that system about? That's the same one we are talking about, uh, mm. the common platform. Yes. Right. That's the system that telcos are supposed to integrate to by 1st of July. Is, is, is it a, a purely uh, GRA? I mean, w which are the entities on board? What do you mean by it? So the Elmas bit, um, is it, are there private entities that have been brought in? Is it, is it the GRA and purely 
the EMIs or are they so, outside? So GRE is um, developing that system with um, consultants, help, but it is a GRE system. Yeah. It's a GRE system. Did the GRE build it itself? The, your IT team? Did you did you outsource? Oh, those those are not within my scope. But at least it's a system that we provide the requirements. We have uh, made sure the APIs that the telcos will use uh, are um, the requirements are what GRE wants. So that the, I, it meets I, your specifications. It meets our specifications. Yes, and the telcos have seen it. We've shared it with them. I mean, on the technical side, we share the APIs with them. Um, we've taken feedback. Um, there's been improvement to it. Um, it it's as as um, um, Doc said, we're using Agile, so we are moving some. Um, the initial APIs we shared didn't have some um, features. Now we've added those features. So it's something that we are developing um, as and when we get feedback. It also got to be integrated with our internal core tax application. So it means that on the core tax application side. We need to also make uh, modifications which um, have okay. been made to be able to accept those um, transactions. Even in this modified approach, um, you asked how would the funds reach GRE because the funds are currently not with GRE. It right. is held up um, by the charging entities. Right. It is that is the EMIs, right? The, the EMIs, the PSPs, the bank, the SDI, all, all right, of them right, right. together are the charging entities. So it's not only EMIs. All the charging entities, yeah, they need to now pay these um, collections they've done to us. The agreed time period is now 48 hours. So after today, from tomorrow, they will generate what we call a tax bill and then pay onto um, the GRA tax um, um, portal, and then they pay through the Ghana.gov payment platform. So these are systems that all exist to to help this thing roll out go seamlessly. All right. Mr. Uh, Hende, your, your final bite as we conclude the conversation. So what can we expect in the coming days, weeks, ahead of July? What should we be looking forward to in terms of helping the process become as fine-tuned as possible? Well, thank you very much. I think like uh, Doc said and like um, Isaac has said, we are working collaboratively um, to ensure that we give the best experience um, to Ghanaians. And that is the focus. So each day you see improved uh, scenarios and as we identify the specific issues that come up we try and resolve those issues and um, even more importantly um, the fact that we anticipated some of these because we knew where we were uh, to day one uh, that has even helped us to prepare you know to deal with those issues uh, because they aren't coming to us as a surprise and so for me um, I want to ask um, our customers Ghanaians to be patient as we go through the process. It's a big project. Um, there are several facets that are being pulled together. Um, you will not have 100% a smooth run from day one. As the businesses and the entities um, interact, we will begin to improve, enhance. And so Ghanaians and customers, you expect better experiences as, as, the, as the day goes. And per the the requirement, by the time we hit the full implementation, right. we would have resolved all the specific issues and uh, we should have a, a very uh, smooth uh, project going forward. So thanks right. for all the support and right. we we'll continue to count on people like you Most to, to spread the word and to ensure that we can um, educate. Uh, we did for you, we did for you. Thank you. Uh, but, but before you go, I, I was wrapping the conversation. I just saw this. I, I have to do it because it's, it's a very interesting one. George Amwako Temeng, maybe in 30 seconds, I don't know which one of you will take it. He says, please, can you ask him whether online bank transfers to investment accounts like mutual funds attracts the e-levy? I need some clarity on that. Can you ask whether online bank transfers to investment accounts like mutual funds attracts the e-levy? So, um, Some of these answers are not straightforward. Um, so if you are in doubt, you just check with the law how the investment account is your own. It has the details of your Ghana card on that investment account. And the funds you're moving from, it's also your own. It has the backing of your Ghana card. The law says that such transfers should not attract the e-levy. So there's a caveat. You go to the exclusion. The exclusion that transfer to same person account shouldn't attract the e-levy. 
So the investment account is registered in your name. It has your identity behind it. The source you are also transferring has your name and identity on it. Okay. No 11. All right. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Amwako, uh, together with uh, Mr. Henne for joining uh, the conversation. We're grateful. And like Thank you. I've said, we'll keep engaging you so that there's better education for, for us and for the people out there. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, Isaac Kobina Amwako is head project management with the GRA. Uh, and Mr. Eli Hene is CEO of the Mobile Money uh, Limited. Now, when we return, the second leg of our conversation this morning has to do with the TUC uh, situation. And uh, it's, it, we celebrated Workers' Day yesterday. Today is actually the holiday. But uh, the TUC, NAT, and other labor unions are asking for better conditions of service. What is the way forward? We have General Secretary of the TUC. Dr. Ba joining us for a conversation. Do stay. Thank you for staying with us. So on our second leg of the big stories, uh, we talk about labor and their conditions of service. Joining us for the conversation, Dr. Yao Ba, he is uh, Secretary General of the TUC. Thomas Musa is General Secretary of uh, NAT. Gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us on the AM show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Ba, I, I shall start with you. Uh, you've been calling in recent times for quite a lot. Uh, you've been making some calls, even talking about the fact that uh, the petroleum taxes ought to be scrapped. And, and you got the response on May Day, Mr. President, saying that 4 billion Ghana cities is what we stand to lose if we take off the petroleum uh, taxes. But you have called for exactly that. Uh, there's also that orders you with clocks act, but I'll leave that for later. But when you look at the conditions of service uh, of members of the TUC, what would you describe as your current status quo, your, your, your current situation? Thank you very much. First of all, let me thank all workers of Ghana for uh, celebrating the May Day in a, in a special way yesterday. Uh, we haven't had opportunity to do that in about two years. This is the third year. And so uh, I think it was really exciting to see workers across the country jubilating around and also, you know, letting all those people who are managing this economy know that things are not going well. Uh, the speech I read was on behalf of organized labor, and the idea was to communicate to all those who, who matter, including the president, the vice president, the Minister for Finance, that things are not going well. Conditions of service for workers uh, have not been good, especially in the last two years. As we mentioned in the speech, the salaries are declining in real value. In the last one year or two, we have lost nearly 50% of the real value of our incomes. Uh, on top of that, we had very low uh, rate of increase for 2021 and 2022. At the time we were negotiating, inflation was 9%. Now inflation is nearly 20%. And that was why we were asking government to, as a matter of urgency, uh, grant COLA so that people's burdens will reduce. And I want to share with you, yesterday, the president of Kenya granted 12% increase in minimum wage for all those in Kenya who earn minimum wage. And that is what we were expecting our president to do yesterday. Mm. Uh, just to clarify, so you said that within the last two years, your members have lost about 50% of the value of, of, of their revenue or their, what, what they get at the end of the month? Of, of their salaries, yes. Because if you, if you are on a fixed-term income, you are not able to adjust your income or earning as prices uh, move up. We are not like those who are trading. We are not like those who have shops. Uh, if uh, exchange rate deteriorates, you can easily adjust. But if you have fixed income, you have to go through negotiations. Now, we did that last year for the two years, 2021, 2022. Now, what we are asking government uh, to do, especially the president, is to use his executive powers 
And um, as he did during COVID, to grant 50% increase in salary for health sector workers. Now to all public sector workers, including those in the armed forces and the security agencies. That is the only way, in our opinion, you can reduce the burden immediately. As we work towards reviewing the single spine, as we work towards making sure the inequality in the public service is also reduced or eliminated completely. Right. A quick one before I move on to Mr. Musa as well. I, I, I just want to find out, you, you draw that link between what has happened in Kenya and the 12% increment on the minimum wage uh, in, in that country. But you are asking for a COLA or cost of living allowance increment of 20%. Is that tied to the inflationary rate? Yes, it is. As I said, when we were negotiating, inflation was 9%. And even at the time, we got 7% uh, for 2022. The reason was because the projected inflation for 2022 was 6 plus or minus 2, which means that government was expecting inflation to be maximum 8%. Now inflation is 20%, almost. Now, if you even isolate the, the, the items in the basket, you will see that the very, very essential items uh, have had higher prices. Water, for example, the price has gone up on average by 27%. Food, by 22 or 25%. And if it happens like that, and you don't do anything to reduce the burden, you, you risk a lot. And that is why I did not agree fully with the president saying that if I reduce or if I remove all taxes on petroleum, Ghana will lose 4 billion. I don't understand what he meant by loss. You see, if you give something to your, your citizens, you haven't lost anything. The president only looked at the money aspect in terms of quantum, what, whatever he said he was going to lose. But if in some countries, they actually give money to their citizens, it is not a loss. I think this is a social investment that we need to do to bring calm to society, to avoid any, uh, any problems from uh, the social groups and so on. Especially if it's coming from labor. We want the labor market to be quiet so that we can recover quickly. And I, I hope the president will take this uh, uh, again because uh, when we start engaging on the key issues that I raised uh, yesterday, we will bring it up again. We will bring it up again, again, and again because we need to also look at the benefits on, uh, for society that can... So, so that means uh, you are not backing from, down on that, on, on that request. You are not going to back down on it. Not at all. Not at all. We will continue to engage on all the key issues and we'll bring this up again. Uh, for you, Mr. Musa, uh, as General Secretary of uh, NAT, uh, where would you say Labour finds itself today? I mean, if you could paint a picture for us, what would that picture be? Hello, Mr. Musa. Are, are you with me? All right. Uh, I believe uh, we'll try to reconnect with Mr. Musa. But, but let me come back to you, Dr. Ba. So quickly on this. Now, you, you made mention of the fact that when you look at the price of a liter of fuel, it constitutes 80% of the minimum wage. Now, as it stands, uh, we've been told that the prices of petroleum, petrol, and diesel are going to go up again. It's only LPG that will not be affected. How do you feel this is going to squeeze uh, your members even further? I mean, what do you feel is going to be the realistic impact of another surge in petroleum and diesel prices? This, this is going to be bad for everybody, not only our members. And especially so, so for those who don't earn any income at all. So if, for example, I work and I get 13.53 a day, and I want to buy a liter of kerosene. I spend 80% of that at current prices. And if this should go up again, I don't know what will happen. We hope it will not. Because yeah. it's going to you know, create a lot of uh, problems, not only for our members, but also especially for poor people who don't earn any income in this country, and who rely solely on some of these products to survive. 
Uh, let, me, let me bring in Thomas Musa uh, now. Mr. Musa, thank you for staying with us. I, I was asking you to paint a picture for us. Where, where, where do you think Labour, especially those in NAT, find themselves today in terms of the economic circumstances? It appears we've lost uh, Mr. Musa again. But, but let me ask you uh, very quickly, Dr. Ba. So when it comes to this talk, which the president has brought to the fore as well, about the single spine salary structure, uh, that payment system was meant to ensure that everyone, you know, falls into, th everything falls into the proper places when it comes to jobs and, and getting equal pay for equal work. It appears things haven't exactly panned out the way we planned over 10 years after implementation. But the president has hinted oh, that we ought to look at it as a people and see whether we even want to move ahead with it. What is your take on the single spine and how it could either better the fortunes of your members or otherwise? When we started single spine in 2010, between 2010 and 2013, things went well. I mean, if you uh, analyze the real value that the single spine brought to our people, it was significant and substantial between 2010 and 2013. From 2013, 2014, when again we didn't get any increase in 2014, we got a cola of 10%, then things started getting worse. Since then, we have not recovered. That's why we call for a review of the single spine. And when we, we met at Kwa at the conference, all the stakeholders agreed. And that is what we are doing. The process has started. We already have constituted a technical team to advise the National Tripartite Committee on what to do. So I think what the president was saying was just to let the people of Ghana know, and especially workers who are on the single spine know that government has not forgotten about them and that government is making efforts to review. And we expect that the review will address all the challenges, especially the low level of pay for those on the single spine. Because as I said in the address yesterday, if you compare uh, salary structures on, uh, of other public sector workers, and you compare that with single spine, uh, you'll see that those on single spine are worse off. And therefore, we expect that the low levels of pay uh, as a big issue will be addressed. The other one has to do with the pay inequality between those on single spine, Article 71, and all those on the state-owned enterprises uh, who are getting uh, not only higher salaries, but already numerous allowances uh, compared to those on the single spine. Right. I'll come back to you uh, shortly, Dr. Ba. Uh, but, but let me bring in Thomas Musa. Thomas, uh, thank you for joining the conversation. Thank you, and good morning to your good self and to our leader, uh, leader of organized labor, uh, Dr. Yalba, and to all the listeners. God bless you. Thank you very much. Great. It's good to finally have you. Just speak up a bit for me so I can uh, hear all of what you're saying. So I just want to find out from you. Generally, when it comes to labor matters, where do your members, NAT members, uh, where do they stand when it comes to the cost of living? How, how well are your members faring? Yes, it's an issue of organized labor. And I believe that our leader, in the person of Dr. Yaba, has articulated all the issues eloquently since yesterday when we had the, uh, the, the May Day Parade celebration, at which the, the Excellency, the President of the Republic, was in attendance. So the issues have been articulated already, taking into consideration the current living standards and the condition of workers. We have thoroughly examined the condition of workers based upon which all the issues articulated by our leader was done. So we stand by all the issues that were articulated yesterday, and it's a true reflection of the Ghanaian worker. And that is where we stand. We, that's where we stand. Th that is where you stand. Uh, yeah. but, but in the midst of all the current happenings, I, I, I put this to Dr. Bao, I'll put it to you as well, with fuel prices set to go up again, and no conclusion in sight when it comes to, you know, the sort of cola that you are asking for. I mean, what, what do you foresee? So, so I, yes. I, I think yeah, that I want to be active on the cola and all that. Yes, yes. I'm saying that with...
prices still edging up, especially when it comes to uh, petrol and diesel, which are set to go up again. Uh, and on the back of the fact that whatever negotiations you may have started, uh, Dr. Ba says you will continue harping on the fact that you want a 20% cola. But that has not come yet. I mean, what, what do you foresee happening in that respect? It's simple. We have already indicated. Once it's a, a kind of a social dialogue like Dr. Yaban has indicated since yesterday, it is a matter of appreciating the levels of difficulty, challenges of workers today and where they come from. Look, if you look at as far back as 2021, we went in for 4%. And at the time that we went for the 4%, the rate of inflation was below 10%. Now, this year, the salaries were increased by 7%. But as we speak now, the inflation for this month, but it, uh, this, uh, March, it's 19.4%. And if you take the inflation rating by rating, you will not get any, but majority on the average is about 20 plus percent. So the question is, is it that the Ghanaian workers should continue, continue suffering? Look, let's, there are three things that we need to take note of. Like, I'll keep on making reference to what Dr. Yaban said. The income workers state will have a direct effect on what they take home when they go on pension. And as to, whether the, as to whether a worker will be able to retire into a two-bedroom house when he goes from retirement, it's another story. So this, these are the correlations we need to look at. That the, the money I am giving to the worker, will, it, will that money take the worker home? And if the money cannot take the worker, worker home, if the worker goes on retirement, how will the worker survive? But, but, but gov gov government, Mr. Musa, must also work within its means, work within its budget. And it's telling you now that right now, we don't think we can meet, uh, you know, what you're calling for. I mean, when Dr. Ba talks about the fact that they should scrap the petroleum taxes, Mr. President quickly comes in to say we're going to lose 4 billion Ghana cities. So we simply can't do that now. Uh, shouldn't we just face reality? Uh, we should face reality, yeah. So the condition that we are facing is not a reality. Is that what you are saying? I, I'm not suggesting that. I'm merely saying that. that based, suggesting. No, ba based on how government has reacted, I mean, if they say they don't have the money, what can you do? No, you are saying we should face reality. And I'm also asking you that the worker who actually, we, we, we really considered that looking at the condition of where we are, we took 4% last uh, 2021. And this particular time, we took 7%. And we are saying that, look, the 2023 negotiation, it cannot be so. And we are also asking that, like our, our leader said, Dr. Yama indicated yesterday to, I mean, at the organized labor party, specifically the media, that look, given the condition of work, it's a reality. These are the realities on the ground. We are not doing, we are not dealing with hypothetical situation, or we are dealing with, uh, how do you call it, uh, some kind of uh, 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 situation that, or abstract issues. No, we are dealing with issues and conditions that are happening currently, okay? That is what we are dealing with. And we are saying that, look, the salaries that the workers are taking now, if they go on retirement under such, under such salary, I tell you, even like I, I indicated in one of the interviews, even if God has given you 80 years, the moment you go on retirement, you have only one year to live and you will die. Because even if you are to live for the rest of the next 10 years, you can't survive because you have nothing to live on. You have nothing to live on. And we are even also saying that how, how will the worker be able to retire into a two-bedroom house? So oh, nobody is talking about an abstract thing on a hypothetical issues. We are all talking about realities on the ground. The question is, is inflation 19.4% or not? On the average, look at all the inflation, uh, the, uh, the regional inflation. Go and check. Are the figures they realistic or not? And if they are realistic, why should we look at the government and say that government is dealing with realistic issues, but we, the organized labor, what are we dealing with? The same thing. Okay. So please, these are issues comforting all of us. And like our leader has said, Dr. Yaba has said, we stand by everything that was said on that particular day, and he has our backing. All right. Uh, very quickly on this one, I'll, I'll pose the question to both of you, but I'll start with you, Mr. Musa. So looking at all these dynamics, would you say the single spine policy has lived up to expectation? And if not, what do you want to see in that, let's say, by close of year? Oh, 
you know, uh, at the time of uh, implementing the formulating and subsequent implementation, it was made clear that every five years it will be reviewed. So normally when you are implementing such policies, certainly there are certain dynamics that will come up and there are certain changes that will come up because you cannot foresee everything in the future. So as you implement, at least every five years, you will retreat and ask yourself, how, how, are, we, how are we faring with the policy? So you've got into that particular thing and thank God that there is a committee in place to look at all the issues and then we take it out from there. We believe that what, what we've been able to do, the kind of gaps that have been identified, and the recommendations that will come out with will tell us the way forward. So that is where we are going. I believe that our leader, Dr. Yaman, has articulated all those issues. So we come with him and we, we then want to assure him he has our party. All right. Dr. Ba, same question uh, to you. Thank you. But first of all, let me make a point about this whole thing about governances doesn't have the money. This is not the first time we have heard this. When the banking sector was not uh, going well, what happened? Government found money, even when it was not in the budget, over 20 billion Ghana cities to address that issue. What we are saying now is that workers are suffering because we granted pay increase well below inflation. Now, if that is not taken seriously, and then there is this mantra of we don't have the money. When there is social unrest, government will have money to deal with it. And we should not wait until there is that labor unrest or social unrest. Because if it continues like that, and people cannot survive. And you know, when it comes to survival, there is no formula, there is no method. People will do whatever it takes to survive. And that is why we advise government to reconsider. What government is saying they cannot do is a matter of priority. What they are telling us is that workers' incomes are not priority for them. That's how I understood uh, what, what happened yesterday. So your, your understanding is purely them, that your interests are not priority for them. They are telling you they don't have the money. You say it's simply because they are not prioritizing that's what I'm correctly. My understanding is that if, if the time comes for them to find the money, they'll find it. But they shouldn't wait for that unrest to come before they find the money. They should be able to find the money. Because when something is not going well in the society, it is the responsibility and duty of government to address. So simply say Ghana is going to lose $4 billion. It's not enough for us to just cow down and say, oh, OK, the president says uh, government cannot pay $4 billion. What is that? We, we, that is not, you know. So we have accepted to continue to dialogue. And we are hoping that something good will come out of the dialogue. Um, and that dialogue is going to start very, very soon. Right. Just, just tell me, when you, when you suggest this um, civil or social unrest, what do you mean? I mean, you understand social unrest. When people are pushed to the wall um, and they cannot survive and they cannot get what, is, uh, what will make them survive, the very basic essentials, you know, uh, let me even limit it to labor unrest. If workers decide today that if you don't want to grant COLA or you do not want to address the shortfall of our income in real terms, we will not go to work. That is going to derail everything in this country. That is labor unrest. If it is extended to social unrest where non-workers join and say that we support the workers and then we are on the streets every day, what will happen? We will derail the process. So I think government should take us seriously engage us as they have promised they are going to do. And then I think together, we should be able to find a solution before um, the situation gets worse. So you foresee that if, if they don't deal with your situation, as you're suggesting, we, we shall get to this point? I think so. I, and I have told the president before, uh, before 2022, and the president invited us to his office. And I told him, you know, we had two hours of talk, talking about employment crisis, incomes, and so on. And then he gave me the opportunity to, 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 to end the conversation. And I told him, Mr. President, I foresee that if we don't do what is right, something will happen, uh, social unrest. And you know how Ghana is politically charged. As we get close to elections, things will not, get, things will not be as we see today. Because there will be a lot of heat. 
the temperature will rise. And though we don't have to wait until mm. that time comes. And I hope the president will listen to us. I, I am curious, uh, Dr. Ba. You, inflation currently stands at around 19.4%. And you're asking for a 20% COLA, cost of living allowance. Uh, let's assume government goes ahead to grant you this. And then inflation shoots up again to, let's say, 30%, God forbid, because that would strangulate us. But let's assume that were to happen. Would you now go ahead and, and ask for another increment? I, I don't know how old you are. I, God doesn't forbid 30% inflation in this country. We have seen 120% increase in inflation in Ghana before. In the mid-1990s, inflation was around 70%. God did not forbid that. So things can happen if you don't but work Of course, I, I use that term because it's not what we would want. It is not that I'm not aware that we've, we've had oh, these gargantuan no, inflationary that, but, I mean, who wants before. inflation? Nobody wants it. But in Zimbabwe, they have million percent inflation. We have to work to make sure inflation is thin. If that doesn't happen, then government has a big uh, problem because you have 700,000 workers. And these workers are providing all the essential services in this country. The teachers, the health workers, the police, the military, all these guys are on the payroll of government. And so if what you are giving them cannot even take them home, then there is a serious crisis. Therefore, it is the responsibility of government to ensure that inflation is tamed so that the demands from workers will also be minimized. But for as long as inflation goes up, we would demand that the salaries that we get for providing the services I've just mentioned should match inflation. That we will continue to demand, even if inflation goes to 100%. Uh, Mr. Musa, let me, let, me, let me bring you in as well. When you consider uh, Article 71 office holders, for example, and their benefits, when you consider uh, CEOs of state-owned enterprises and their benefits, some of them you know, getting three times what Mr. President gets and all of that, how do you feel you know, we can find some uh, minimum level where everybody can benefit without a short, very limited percentage, about 7%, getting so much, and the rest of you in the public sector getting so little? What do you think can be done? Exactly. You see, that is the concern we have in this particular country. Where always workers should be told that our 56% of revenue goes into payment of compensation or go, uh, uh, going to compensation. The question is, if let's say the money is 100 Ghana cities and you have about 10% or even less than that of the workforce, that takes 90 Ghana cities. And you have the rest of about, let's say, uh, uh, you have a rest of about 80% of the workers sharing the 10 Ghana cities. Will you say that everybody is benefiting from that? No. It is because of the way the compensation system, the, the, the current compensation regime that we have, that is what, that is what has created some of these problems that we are facing now. Because the money is going to some few, then the rest are suffering. And that is what yesterday, like I keep on making reference to what Dr. Yaban said yesterday, he indicated all those things. Then there is a need for us to, I mean, look at the compensation regime that we have in the country. So that in compensating people, compensate in such a way that when, when we all take our salary, everybody will be okay. When we all go, go on pension, everybody will not feel, I mean, feel cheated or will not feel that you will not live long. So now you can, everybody will have the opportunity of retiring. At least some two-bedroom house when you, after working for 30, 40 years for the country. These are the issues we are talking about. But it cannot be that some people can build three, four, while there are people in the country, even the, the, the pension, they have nothing to take them home. And mm. the moment they go on pension, death will be staring them in their face. So these are the things that we are talking about. And right. like I keep on saying, yesterday, our leader, Dr. Yama, articulated all those things to the president. And this morning, we are glad that he has articulated the same thing. And I think the duty bearer should take what our leader is saying seriously. So that together we can see how best we can help the Ghanaian worker. Right. And we stand by everything we are saying. Right. To cap off the conversation, uh, gentlemen, uh, I, I would like to, I'll, I'll come to you, Mr. Musa, for your final take, maybe in about a minute. But, Dr. Ba, I just want to find out. You have a bit of a divided front. 
you have Clocksack doing its own thing, and you have stood uh, against the neutrality allowance, so to speak. Uh, they held their own May Day celebration, and, and you did yours as well. How, how do you think uh, you can find some unity moving forward so that you can fight together? Uh, first of all, uh, it is not true to say that uh, we are against the neutrality allowance. We, we well, that is what that. has been suggested. They, they say you are... Yeah, but uh, we have never said that anywhere. I mean, right. we have never said that. What we have said was that, uh, that if government grants the neutrality allowance to civil servants, uh, that same allowance should be granted to all public sector workers who are supposed to be neutral. Uh, for example, electoral commission workers, NCC, the soldiers, the police. Yes, yes. In the, uh, the, I, I've heard all you mention all of these. Uh, but but what, yeah. is the way, what, what is the way forward? And so uh, let, me, let me tell you, you'll be surprised to note that yesterday it was uh, Isaac Bampuado, the executive secretary of CLOSA, who organized a press conference uh, and said all kinds of things. Did you know that he came to uh, the reception after the May Day celebration at the park? We went to a reception and he was with us. So I asked him, you see- oh, You, you mean he was with you, the, 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 the TUC? He, he then joined you, yes. the TUC? Yes, we were together. Yes, we were together with the president at the reception. And I, I told him that I warned him that, listen, don't go there and say things that will make people believe that organized labor is divided. We are not. We are not. We are going to fight this together because it's, a, it's in our common uh, interest. Uh, so, so, so are you suggesting then that, 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 that the, uh, the leadership of Clocksag is being hypocritical? I mean, they are painting one picture and... In, in, in... I don't know. I mean, uh, you said it. I didn't say that. But what I'm saying is that what he said at the previous press conference that they will not participate in uh, May Day, that didn't happen. Because I just want you to know that we are together. Things sometimes don't go as we all expect, uh, because of course, we are human beings. But when they do, we come together, we trash things out. And I want to assure you that we are together because yesterday, uh, the executive secretary of Prozac actually came to our reception and we had a chat. The president was with us. And uh, we joked, and we were saying that, listen, don't do this again, because it makes people think that we are not together. It's not good for our members. We can right. understand each other as leaders. But when you say things like that, our members may not understand how mm. we get to this. But let me assure you, and all workers of Ghana, that on issues of incomes, on issues of jobs, I mean, decent jobs, all organized labor groups are together. OK. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Ba. Your final comments, uh, Mr. Musa, before I let go of the two of you. Certainly, we are all together. Right. Organized labor, we're working together. The, the speech that was delivered yesterday was delivered for and on behalf of organized labor. Right. So we stand together. Thank you very much and God bless. Hey, Dr. Yaba, we are grateful. God bless. All right. You're welcome, my brother. Well, that's how we cap off the conversation, Dr. Ba. We're immensely grateful for your time, uh, Thomas Musa, as well. Dr. Yaba is Secretary General of the TUC. Thomas Musa is General Secretary of uh, NAP. But this is where we leave off the first part. We're coming to you with the second part, and we're asking you, the e-levy, I mean, what has been your experience so far? Have you paid it yet? Uh, were you legitimately charged, or was there a bit of a problem? Share your experience with us on the AM Show. Share on social media with the hashtag AM Show. And when we activate the phone lines, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, to know what your experience has been like. The next leg of the show continues right here on the AM Show. Do stay.